Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about blood pressure. You know, the uh, the other day I was in the in the lab room, and I thought I'd pull out our blood pressure cuffs um, and see what my blood pressure was. And so I took a reading, and lo and behold, the numbers were 115 over 80. And so in this particular video, I'd like to get into a discussion with you about what these numbers mean and what is blood pressure in general and what are, this, what are the factors that, uh, that cause it and some of the issues surrounding it. And so um, let's get into that. Um, what I wanted to say right out of the gate is that blood pressure is simply a force being exerted on the wall of a blood vessel. Okay, as you can see here is when blood flows through a particular vessel, uh, it pushes out on the, the wall of the, of the blood vessel. And when I say it, I'm meaning like the plasma, the liquid, uh, the cells, and all of that is, 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 uh, is creating a force. And that force against the wall of the blood vessel is causing um, the pressure. And so if I were to try to draw like this, a, a typical vessel right here, and there's blood flowing in it, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that blood is pushing out on the wall right there that's what the blood is doing it's pushing on the vessel wall and so that pushing creates a force and so it's it's as simple as the force over the surface area of the of the vessel is what we're is what we mean by in terms of a definition blood pressure okay now uh, the simplicity of this um, can get more intense when you start talking about some of the physical, although it gets interesting, you get some of the physical laws that govern this in, in, in terms of there's all kinds of physics and liquid dynamics that control um, what the pressure in general. And so I just want to touch, this video isn't looking at the physics of liquid dynamics, but I just want to touch on a couple things and maybe you already know it, meaning that when liquid is flowing through a pipe, and the, the, the segment of the pipe becomes more narrow, that increases the flow through the pipe. And so that's a particularly important point because blood vessels will vary in diameter. And so this will affect velocity of the blood traveling through those vessels. But it seems like a little bit of a contradiction because like, for example, if you're looking down here at this diagram, um, this artery right here has a wider diameter than arterioles. And so you would think, you know, as the, as the flow, the velocity of the blood is going through, it would increase. And this is the most narrow blood vessel of all these capillaries. And you think it would really be going fast there. But in fact, when you look at the actual velocity of the blood, it really dramatically slows down when it gets into the capillary beds. And this is pretty important physiologically for the body because this is exactly what you'd want it to do is to slow down because that's where exchange takes place. Gas exchange, both oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones and nutrients and all of that, osmosis diffusion is occurring here. But it's like, well, you just said that when it becomes more narrow, it's gonna increase in velocity. But check this out, that the total cross-sectional area of all these capillaries makes this a wider vessel than it was in the arterial. So in fact, it slows down in the capillaries. And that, so that's kind of cool. So again, just to re reiterate that point, it's like when blood is flowing pretty quickly through an arterial and then it slows down in the capillary and then it increases again in the venule, as you can see here. And so that's pretty interesting. And I was mentioning that that is very conducive to exchange. And so when the blood is slowly moving cell by cell through the capillaries, that's where oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients and hormones are exchanged. And so when the blood leaves the capillary bed and travels into a venule and then a vein and heading back toward the heart, it's increasing uh, because there's a little bit of a reduction in the surface area of those vessels compared to the capillary bed. And so I just wanted to define something like pulse as well, because this is important in terms of pressure. Um, you all know it. You know that pulse is basically an indirect way to look at heartbeat. And so when you're 
you're, um, you're measuring your pulse either at your wrist or in, in your neck, you're basically looking at heart rate. In other words, the number of times your heart is beating uh, per minute generally is how it's measured. And so you can use your fingers and wrist and what you're feeling is the bulge that the blood puts on the, on the artery and that counts as a heartbeat. So every time your blood vessel bulges, you can feel it. And so that's your pulse. And so what is that surge or that, that feeling, that bulge? Well, it has to do with the fact that the pressure is, um, as it's moving through uh, and from an artery to an arterial, it's exiting from the artery. It's exiting uh, a little bit slower. In other words, the arterial is uh, slowing, as it says here, the, the surge of the pressure is partly due to the narrow opening of the arterial. And so it's impeding the exit of blood from the artery. So when the blood's coming in, it slows down and it causes the vessel to sort of expand a little, the arterial. And so basically when the heart is contracting, each time it contracts, it enters uh, this vessel and it stretches and therefore causes a little bit of a bulge and you can measure that as a heartbeat. And so basically that's what, what the pulse is. Now, you might already uh, predict that blood pressure is greater in an artery than in the vein because the pressure itself is being generated by the contraction of the ventricles. And so you might know this, but the, when the ventricles are contracting, here they are down here, when they're contracting, it's known as ventricular syst systole, okay, when they're contracting, ventricular systole. And when they're relaxing, it's re referred to as diastolic or di diastole when they're relaxing. As it turns out, they're relaxing more than they are contracting. And so in terms of like, if you were to break this up into fractions, two thirds of the time, we're in a diastole phase. In other words, when the ventricles are relaxing or technically the word means to be filling. So this is when the ventricles are filling and this is when they're pumping. So you can imagine the pressure when the ventricles are contracting that's when the blood is really raging, and I'll, I'll go red here if I'm coming out of the aorta. That's when the blood is really raging. That's the highest pressure of all. And so it's, it's surging and then it's relaxing, surging and it's relaxing in terms of the pressure. Okay, and more, more of that to come. I also wanna talk about something called cardiac output. In other words, it's the, it's the volume of blood that's pumped by the heart per minute. Okay, so it's milliliters of blood per, mi per minute. And so you're like, well, what is this? Well, it's a function of heart rate, which is the number of beats. So if you were to take your pulse and go, all right, so I'm gonna take my pulse and it's 70 beats, okay? And then you would say, well, the cardiac output, you said is the volume of blood pumped per minute. And you're like, well, isn't the volume having to do with the, like the amount of blood, say for example, the left ventricle, contains that's right and so this is referred to as the stroke volume in other words the amount of blood that's exiting the heart from the left ventricle so if you were to measure that that's approximately this is the number of beats right here um, the amount of blood the volume of blood now it'll vary from individual to individual because everyone's heart is slightly different but let's just say on average that the average stroke volume is around 70 milliliters. And so basically what you'd have is 70 beats times 70 milliliters, and you'd get something like 4,900 uh, milliliters uh, per minute. And so that would be a typical cardiac output. So to translate that to just, you know, come away message is that around five liters of blood are being pumped out of the heart per minute. Okay, so that's what's known as the cardiac output. It's simply the heart rate times the stroke volume in, um, and it comes out to around five liters per minute. Okay, so let's get back to the blood pressure a little bit more earnestly in terms of what those numbers mean. I was mentioning, I was gonna tell you a little bit about what those, what those two numbers were. Well, you might know that because you've probably had your blood pressure measured, it's measured with a device called, and this is a mouthful, sphygmomanometer. In other words, 
a device or a blood pressure cuff that surrounds or wraps around your arm. And in particular, we most often measure blood pressure and it could be blood pressure could be measured right out of the heart, like right in the aorta. But, it, but it's most often, about 95% of the time, it's measured right here in the upper arm. And in the arm, there's a blood vessel, an artery called the brachial artery, in which we can easily measure. So it's right here, the brachial artery. And so what's happening is this blood pressure cuff is being put around and then it's pumped up. And what it's doing is it, it's cutting off the blood supply to the brachial artery. So you'd want to pump it up to a pressure uh, and it's measured in milli millimeters of mercury. And that's what this is, millimeters. I'll just go ahead and write it in. Millimeters of mercury, HD, a liquid metal. So if you pump that up above what you think the person's highest blood pressure is, and that's when the ventricles are contracting, that's known as the systolic pressure or ventricular systole. Um, say you were to pump it up to about 140 and then you were listening with a stethoscope. Okay, let me take you back over here. So do you see how, how this student is listening with a, with a stethoscope right there? And so when you pump it up above the, the pressure, you're actually basically cutting off the circulation to the, to the person. And so then when you release the pressure gauge right, over here, slowly blood will start to, to go through the brachial artery. And when you're listening right there with your stethoscope, the very first time you hear, you would hear nothing when, it, when it's cut off, but the first time you hear a sort of t -t 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 tapping sound, you would take note of that and you'd read it on, on your, uh, your meter over here. And, and if, if it says 120 millimeters of mercury, that's your systolic pressure. And then you're hearing, you know, swish coming through, and then eventually you don't hear anything at all. And the moment you don't hear anything at all, the last time you hear tapping sounds uh, is your diastolic pressure. So this person right here, if you're following this, would be a 120 over 70. Now, that's about average. I mentioned over here that an average, uh, typical, now this you know, average is average. So 120 systolic over 80 is, is typical, okay? It, it, it's variant in terms of your age as well. And so basically, again, here's a student who uh, has the, you're looking at millimeters of mercury as measured in pressure right here. Uh, and you're cutting off and you're measuring blood pressure right here in the brachial artery. So that's what you're looking at. But today we mostly use digital blood pressure cuffs. And so it's, you don't have to listen to it, to it on the stethoscope because it has to be very quiet. Um, to hear those sounds. And so basically what we do now is just wrap this around a person's arm and it digi digitally records it. So this would be a person that has a systolic pressure, um, which is 120. And again, that's when the ventricles are contracting. And then when it's in di di diastolic pressure, diastole, when it's relaxing and filling up, that would be 80. But in terms of two numbers, you could just take the average between those. I mean, that, you could do that as well. Now, I wanted to briefly look at high blood pressure, which is known as hypertension, higher blood pressure. And that's consistent with blood pressure that uh, has higher reading than normal. And so I mentioned 120 over 80 as being typically normal. What we're looking at here is something that systolic around 140, a little high, and then diastolic also being a little high, like 90. And so there's different websites and charts uh, that you can look at. And I thought I'd show you this one. So I was mentioning normals around 120 over over 80, or it could be less than 120. It could be 110 over 70. That was all within normal range, anything less than this. But when you start getting numbers higher than 120 over 80, you could be sort of pre-hypertensive or hypertensive stage one or hypertensive stage two if it's getting up really high, like 160 over 100, uh, or anything higher than that, you'd you want to seek medical attention immediately. And so I wanted to mention also that blood pressure is determined by this cardiac output. In other words, the volume of blood coming from the heart uh, is gonna create pressure differential. So in other words, um, the number of beats, uh, the vigor, the, the volume of blood is going to influence the pressure, okay? So it's like turning on a hose. If you increase 
the volume of water, it's going to increase the pressure. Now, um, also we're able to control blood vessel uh, diameter because you may know if you if you're familiar with blood pressure anatomy that this, there are smooth walls uh, smooth muscle in the walls of arteries and arterioles and in particular arterioles and when these smooth muscle contracts that constricts the vessel which increases the peripheral resistance on the blood and that increases the blood pressure. Likewise though, if you relax those smooth muscle fibers in the blood vessel, you're gonna increase the diameter and dilate the vessel and therefore lower the pressure and, uh, it, and, it, and it falls. Uh, you might also know that stress is involved in this. And when I mean stress is a, is a complicated thing, but it nerve impulses. So in other words, the brain can control blood, blood pressure. Hormones can control it. Hormones can even regulate the volume of the blood. Separate video, just saying. Um, the, the kidney is important in that. And so when these signals, however, reach the uh, muscle layer of the arterial, they can help to uh, raise blood pressure. And uh, that will cause blood vessels to uh, constrict or it can cause them to relax depending on what you need. Okay, and so exercise, as you know, will influence blood pressure, or maybe you didn't know it. And so your cardiac output is adjusted in concert with resistance in order to provide the appropriate blood pressure. So it's coordinated to provide the adequate and necessary flow, uh, depending on the demand that the circulatory system needs. And so, for example, in heavy exercise, it seems like this bike rider right here in this photograph is dominating here, uh, riding his bike up this really steep area here around uh, Lake Tahoe, California. Um, when a person's exercising this heavy, what's happening is uh, the arterioles that are working, the muscles will dilate around those arterioles, which will uh, admit a greater flow uh, into the area and therefore uh, decreasing peripheral resistance, okay? And so likewise though, uh, when the cardiac output increases, in other words, the heart is, is pumping really fast, that can support the, uh, the need for increased pressure and therefore cause uh, a rise in blood pressure. And so it depends. And so you could slow pressure down, you could increase pressure depending on, on the need. And then finally, gravity I find to be a particularly interesting one. So when a person's standing, uh, obviously the heart uh, needs to work a little harder and additional pressure is needed uh, to push the blood in the, into the upper extremities of the body if you're, if, you're, if you're standing up as opposed to lying down. And so, uh, the calculations on this is that it's about a 25, 27 millimeter of mercury increase to move the heart to the brain while standing. You're like, well, it must be really difficult for a giraffe if you ever think about things like this, because I mean, the head's up pretty high, much higher than the heart. So it really has to work. How about this? 250 millimeters of mercury pressure in order to get that uh, blood to the brain of a giraffe. And so <laughs> it's pretty intense. So this is a nice uh, diagram to sort of finish my thoughts on blood pressure. And so um, the, when the heart is, is systolic, when the ventricles are contracting, here's diastolic, or else you could just look at the average. And so the we're basically looking at like 120 over 80, especially where we're measuring it typically right in here at the brachial artery. So it's like, you know, 110 over 80, uh, 120 over 80. That's where we're getting those two numbers right there systolic and diastolic. Although when you take the average, it's not just those two numbers, because if you remember, the, the heart is mostly in, in filling than it is contracting. And then eventually the blood pressure would go down. So if you're taking the average and it's like 95 over here, and then over here, it, it could be really low. Let's say it's around 30. And then over here, it's around 20. And then when it enters into the vena cava, it's hardly under any pressure or influence from the heart at all. So we're looking at around five millimeters of mercury as it enters into the right uh, atrium of the heart. Okay, so
hopefully you enjoyed that brief look at blood pressure and I hope you, uh, you learned something and enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.